it's time to flow with the SEO queen. Receive the perfect leads like never before. No traffic's gonna explode. It's time to grow. Welcome to the Jazz and Tech Lounge with Lady Z, a podcast about the secrets to success in technology, music, and business. On Bashani Radio, iHeart Radio, and iTunes, Bashani Radio, always talking about everything from New York City. You can listen to the Jazz and Tech Lounge with Lady Z on any mobile phone or tablet device. The Jazz and Tech Lounge with Lady Z, where we explore tech and enjoy the music while learning the secrets to success in music, technology, and business. Please follow us online at www.ladyze.com and on all social networks at L-A-D-Y-Z-H-E, Lady Z. Please pull out your phones if you're listening to this episode on the Bashani Radio app. And you can keep your audio while you switch to Instagram and follow me on Instagram at L-A-D-Y-Z-H-E. Now, my next guest is a phenomenal woman. She's a filmmaker, videographer, entrepreneur, and she's also a fellow member of Connected Women of Influence and the founder of Blue Child Entertainment. She is uh, the, the force behind uh, Women Lead TV at Connected Women and Influence and just a phenomenal woman all together. I would like to present to some and introduce to others, none other than Landy Maduro. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Hanging in there, of course, you know. Okay, okay. Hanging in there. I know this is keeping up with all of this this craziness with the whole, you know, coronavirus situation. Exactly. Yeah, but, but, you know, I'm staying safe and staying at home, and I'm glad to see that you're doing the same. So mm-hmm. here we are. And I wanted to ask you, what was, what drew you to film? How did you get involved in the business? Sure. So I actually always wanted to act, always loved um, movies. My dad was a big sci-fi buff. And, um, but I started modeling first. So I was a model and then um, got tired of trying to stay a size zero. And I hate auditioning. <laughs> so those two things aren't, aren't, aren't the easiest things when you um, are trying to but break into the industry. Um, but I decided to go to school for photography, actually. So I became a photographer first, um, kind of following in my father's footsteps, who was a photographer when I was a kid. He did wedding photography. So um, went to photography school, started doing a lot of photography, headshots, things like that, um, which came natural because I was an actor. I knew how to coach actors through the headshot process. Um, and then decided, you know what, I don't see enough diverse filmmaking, and I wanted to start making film. And it helped that I went to photography school because I understood lighting and composition and camera angles. Um, so I just started writing and producing my own projects, which parlayed into other people asking me to do theirs. Um, and it just kind of grew from there, and I launched my production company, Blue Child Entertainment. Oh, that's awesome. Awesome. So what, what, like, how, how long has Blue Child Entertainment been along and share with us some of your projects you've worked on? Sure. So we've been uh, an official business since 2012. And I have done a little bit of everything. Um, From a film perspective, we did a a documentary on prostate cancer in the African American community called The Silent Killer, which definitely. Wow. Yeah. (laughs) Which opened a lot of doors for me because we ended up teaming up with nonprofits and taking the film on a national tour. And actually, in November, we took it to the Bermuda Cancer Center and we were looking to go to Europe. Um, But that's kind of on hold due to everything going on with the virus. So that film, even though, you know, we did it, we finished it in 2017, took us about six years, but it still has a life and it has opened so many doors for me that I wasn't expecting. I was doing it just to help men with prostate cancer, but it's given a lot of attention to me as a filmmaker, um, which has been awesome. And then um, we do a lot of production work with corporations. So I do a lot of um, online course shooting, uh, small business commercials, um, you know, kind of things of that nature, as well as still keeping the photography side of my business. 
Oh, wow. That's awesome. So what was the catalyst that got you, you know, motivated to do the documentary on prostate cancer? Well, you know, that is such a funny story. So um, a friend of mine who his father had prostate cancer and his brother had prostate cancer, and he knows he knew he was at risk also being African American. Uh, prostate cancer tends to run um, in more in African American men. They tend to get it at younger ages with more aggressive forms of disease. So he knew he was at risk and he was like, but I don't hear anyone talking about it, not at the barbershop, not at church, like, you know, I want to bring light to this. And, you know, me not having a horse in the game, I was like, wow, I didn't know that either. And how could I, you know, how could I help? So we started researching, I agreed to direct the, the project and I started writing it and I started just learning how all these men, like they don't know where their prostates are in their body. They, it's taboo to talk about it because they don't like the exam. It was just fascinating to me. And so about six months into doing the research on the film, my father got diagnosed with stage one prostate cancer. And so one, I was glad I had the information so I could share it with him when he went to his doctor. Um, and we were able to make educated decisions on what steps he should take. And then my dad also agreed to be in the movie. So this, it became more of a movement, not just a movie. Like I started getting wow. really involved with the nonprofit. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been a labor of love. It's one of those movies I can't put down because I just, I mean, even though it's done and it's been done and I'm working on other film projects and other projects, um, every time I meet a man who has prostate cancer, you know, you get connected to them. The men in our film, like, I care about them, you know, and so I want to help in any way I can. And so just trying to, you know, educate people and share the information. Right. And so, so how can people view this documentary? Where can they stream it? Sure. So we're actually working on that right now. We were only doing live events, but of course, we're not doing that now. Um, they can always watch the trailer if they go to the silent killer, doc.com. And um, if you email us there, we will definitely um, uh, email you when it becomes available on streaming. So we're actually working on that. Oh, wow. That's, that's awesome. So what are the reasons why um, prostate cancer is such a taboo for men to talk about? Like, what did you find in your research? Oh, most of them don't like the digital rectal exam where they know a doctor is going to stick a finger in their rectum. That's what they, you know, kind of shy away from. The sexual mm -hmm. connotation connected to that, they're just like, oh, absolutely not. Ain't nobody doing that to me. I can't tell you how many men I've heard that from, and especially the younger ones. And it's like, it's funny when we do the screenings, um, I men who would never talk about it come up to me afterwards to try to pull me aside and say, hey, I'm having this symptom or I'm having this or I'm having that. Mm -hmm. What should I do? So I always try to have educational information now at every screening because I don't want any man to leave feeling confused or, you know, when we start showing them some of the symptoms mm -hmm. and they're realizing mm -hmm. they have those symptoms that now they're terrified because that doesn't necessarily mean you have prostate cancer, but it does mean you should get it checked out. Now, you know? what, what are the symptoms of prostate cancer? So usually in the early stages, it doesn't have symptoms like most cancers, which is what makes it so deadly. By the time you start having symptoms, you probably have aggressive forms of disease. Mm -hmm. um, but part, some of the symptoms are um, free, you know, frequently urinating, um, pain in the lower abdomen, um, oh gosh, um, those are like kind of the main ones. Mm -hmm. um, but again, once you start feeling that, right, it spread. So how long, I mean, at what age should men start getting checked for it? Excellent question. So they used to say 50, but they're stating now for African American men, they should get tested as early as 40. Um, oh, wow. And that is because a lot of African-American men end up having aggressive forms of disease if they wait past their 40s, especially any man who is African-American or has a history of prostate cancer, no matter what their race. So if their father or brother or uncle mm -hmm. have it, mm -hmm. they need to get tested at 40. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So, man, so when you created this documentary, like, 
what, how did you write this? Did you, I mean, I know your father's involved, but what was the approach you took to putting this documentary together? Sure. And it's funny you say that because my, my filmmaking partner, Chris, that's the one who came to me and, you know, told me his situation. He just wanted to like go and have these group discussions, which I thought would be good. But as you know, men don't like to talk and getting them to talk about their prostates, that is like not, not really happening. So I thought, let's find some men who are dealing with it and follow them. And then we have a host, a friend of mine who's an actor. Um, his name is Rico Ross. He's traveling with us. Um, we, went, we traveled around the United States and we interviewed these men and kind of followed their journey. And then we interviewed healthcare professionals and um, scientists, trying to get more information about right, right. what causes this. And I think most men who come and see it, because, you know, usually we get a lot of pushback. I don't want to see that. And it's going to be boring. But when they connect, when they see the men who are in it, who have prostate cancer and they connect with their stories mm -hmm. and they're like, oh, my gosh, I see myself in them. Because we try to get men from all walks of life. So we have a hip hop mogul, um, Alonzo Williams, who got Dr. Dre's career started. Oh, wow. Yeah, we've got... Um, a family man who's my dad um, and then we had a guy who was health wellness vegan he's actually the only person who passed away in our movie um, and then we oh, have wow. a yeah so we oh, got all walks of life mm -hmm. oh wow wow that documentary sounds really powerful and I, I can't wait to to see it Thank so you. yeah so tell me like you know you started Blue Child you know, entertainment, you were inspired by your father, who's a photographer, and then you made that transition. Like, how did you know when it was time for you to pivot your business, you know, since when you started it? You know, it's funny you, you asked that question, because I remember trying to pivot, and it wasn't the right time, and nothing worked. You know what I mean? Like when you're trying to do something, nothing worked. I wanted to work on this film project. I pulled in, you know, act, um, a friend who's an acting coach and a friend who's a choreographer. Both are who are extremely talented, work in the industry. They were my personal friends. They kept clashing, like nothing was working. And I was like, what is the problem? Like, I don't understand. I, I, I want to do this. And so I put it down for a while and just focused on my photography. And, um, maybe four years later, I picked it up again and reached out to those same people, kind of forgetting about the drama that had happened previously. Mm -hmm. and everything flowed, no problem. Yeah. Like they worked together, they got along. It was like, it was so easy. And I thought it wasn't the right time. Right, right, right. I was forcing something that wasn't ready. Right, right. Absolutely. So, I think we all tend to do that in business. You know, we decide in our heads we want something, but maybe we haven't planned it out properly. Maybe we hadn't looked at, you know, what are the projections if this works, if this doesn't, all that kind of stuff. And when you force those things, it, it never works out, ever works. <laughs> never so works. What, what are the steps to making a successful documentary? Well, in regards to the documentary, that was definitely a learning process. Um, I would say don't try to outline everything and, or outline it, but don't think that you can stick to a structure because mm -hmm. you're dealing with real life. And, you know, once you start meeting people, be open to go another direction as they introduce mm -hmm. you to things that you Flexible. have to know about. Exactly. Like, for instance, in our film, I hadn't thought about the church perspective, especially in the African-American community. Church and the Lord are major to us. Most of us right. grew up in the church, right. in a holiness church. And so even or though I did too. Or a Baptist church. Exactly. Those are like the big, big three. Exactly. Well, and actually four. There's AME, Baptist, uh, Pentecostal, Holy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. And even though I grew up in a Pentecostal church, I wasn't thinking about that perspective until mm -hmm. we interviewed one of the men who had introduced us to um, a pastor in, in Houston, Texas. And that pastor was really trying to bring this information to his church. Right. He asked, could he be part of the film? Right. And interviewing him and he got three other pastors. We did a panel discussion and to hear these men of God talk about a very human situation on a non-spiritual right. level, but still including spiritual elements. It was like, we needed this in our movie because now we got all the people who say, well, God will deliver me. 
and the, uh-huh. the pastors are saying yes, but faith without works are, is dead. So what right. are you doing? Right, and a wise a wise man sees danger and and prepares him him or herself. Exactly. Right. So it was right. like. You know, being open, that made it so much more powerful. We were able to add another element. So I would definitely say the first thing is just let things happen organically. Have your outline, but mm-hmm. then see where it takes you. See where these people take you. Yeah, don't be afraid to to, to um, be flexible. Exactly. So um, for the listeners who are watching this on YouTube with the video, I have to apologize because I was looking at the screen and I was looking at and Landy and I was like, why don't I see my face? My video was off. I was <laughs> but here I am. And you look beautiful, by the way. I like your okay. earrings. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I haven't worn these earrings in a while. I couldn't find my other ones, my favorite ones, so I had to go to the other ones. So <laughs> <laughs> it's true, it's true, Mom. I, I couldn't find my favorite ones. So. <laughs> Yeah, so I want to transition to um, talking about video when it comes to a business context, commercial video. I don't know what the, the term you would use for it, but I think commercial video would, would work. Um, what strategies have you found that really help uh, convey a business's value proposition effectively through the medium of video? Awesome question. I think the first thing is make sure your videos are are in line with the brand that you projected for your business. The the mistake I see a lot of, you know, small business owners make who are just trying to do it on their own is their videos look nothing like when you go to their website or look nothing like if you visit their business. And those things all need to be cohesive. So the colors that you're using for your website, you you know, try to have them in your video, the same type of font and text. You want everything to feel like it is cohesive. That way you're staying true to your brand. And sometimes that means planning it out. That doesn't mean on Monday you have a shoot on Tuesday and think that it's going to be this awesome, elaborate thing. You kind of have to go through that planning phase of making sure you get it right. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's great advice. You know, I'm actually, I just finished um, editing some videos for um, my, my brand. And that was one of the struggles is just, you know, making sure the branding was consistent as possible, Mm -hmm. Um, consistent as possible. The logos, the colors, everything. So everything. And that's good. That's good that you did that because a lot of people forget it. You yeah, know, when they true. get this idea and you're like, oh, I got this great idea. Okay, but that doesn't look like anything else that you have. Right, right, right. So it's really important to be mindful about that. So what else would you recommend for business owners? Um, I would say, and this is something actually I was just shooting a tutorial for, especially right now. You know, so many of us are being forced to pivot, especially right. like a service-based business. Absolutely. Now you're going to figure out how to, can I do this virtually? And sometimes right. it translate virtually. If you're a nail technician, how does that translate virtually? You know, right. if you're a masseuse. So um, for those who are really trying to figure out that pivot of, of doing video now through mediums like Zoom or mm-hmm. shooting more tutorial things, um, there's just some basic things to keep in mind, like making sure that you're lit well, making sure that, you know, it really doesn't matter what you're shooting on, but making sure your camera is in front of you, not in your lap, because up your nose is not an attractive shot, <laughs> no matter. <laughs> Would you be surprised how many people have their cameras down here and are wondering? <laughs> I'm like, no, I love I love <laughs> That's hilarious. But I, I I definitely, you know, I think I, I shot a video or took a picture a while ago and I posted it on my Facebook and I got several texts from family members saying, we don't need to see your nose that close. <laughs> I offer it and then I've gotten, I've gotten the text from family members saying, remove that picture off your social media. <laughs> right. Like, this and, and, does not look right or this does not look right. I have a whole like QA. <laughs> That is funny. That pops up. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, but it makes sense because this isn't what you do. You know what right, I mean? So right, you, right. Don't, you don't know what you don't know. Exactly. And so just exactly. trying to help business owners. I'm actually, I actually was shooting that earlier mm-hmm. and I'm going to post it just for free, just so people can have some quick tips 
on how to do those videos so that way they don't feel you know like why, why is this not working well you got to sit facing the window not with it behind you so that we can see you <laughs> you know so right, right 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 just helping people so my question to you is where are you going to post this where can people connect with you so they can make sure they don't miss your awesome content awesome thank you for asking so you can always go to my website bluechildentertainment.com mm -hmm. and i will be launching my blue child entertainment um youtube page where i'll start to have a lot of tutorial videos just to help people and if you're still feeling stuck after getting those quick and easy tips i'm doing um one-on-one -on -one consulting so if you want me to look at your setup mm -hmm. um i can do that for you as well oh that's awesome so you sound like you have a lot of things going on always all of our filmmaker buzz what are you doing for filmmakers and fans of film Awesome question. So I actually have an organization called Women of Color Filmmakers, and I help female filmmakers from all walks of life um, kind of learn more about the filmmaking process, how to make their independent films look more polished and professional. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, with COVID-19, we've taken that virtual. Um, and so we've been doing online virtual events. Uh, we had something the other day called Script to Screen, where we read scenes from studio films, and then we watch those clips to see how much of the scripts actually made it in. Um, oh, wow. we have, yeah, we have a director's workshop coming up um, to help independent filmmakers, our first-time directors, learn about the directing process, which we will be doing virtually. That's so, awesome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Aspiring Tyler Perry's and Ava DuVernay, they can definitely get connected to some great resources that's awesome yes so what films have you guys dissected lately we actually just dissected on tuesday night we did um if Beale street could talk yes it was really good we lost you for a second i was saying i love that film if Beale yes. street could talk i thought that film was just it was so beautiful. It's beautifully done. I mean, yeah. Regina King has really just evolved into this phenomenal actress, but just the whole ensemble mm -hmm. in that film, it was just beautifully shot. The music was perfect. I mean, just the whole emotion, like, that movie was phenomenal. Exactly. Was and Barry Jenkins is phenomenal. You know, he did Moonlight first, and then he did right. Bill Street Could Talk, and he actually wrote those films back to back so he says those are like to him they kind of belong together in his mind mm -hmm. even though bill street could talk is an adaptation of james baldwin's book yeah but i actually i really really i i saw both films i saw moonlight and i saw if bill street could talk but you know there's just something about james baldwin's work yes yeah something about his his work that's just like mm -hmm. I don't know what's the right adjective. It's just powerful. It's powerful. Yeah, exactly. It's really powerful. Mm -hmm. And um, when I watch old film of James Baldwin speaking or relaxing in Paris or whatever, <laughs> it's like that is one self-possessed man. Exactly. <laughs> his words resonate through time. Yes, they do. Him and August Wilson, I feel. Or like that. Absolutely, absolutely. August Wilson, who wrote Fences, I saw the film uh, Fences with uh, uh, Viola Davis and Denzel uh -huh. Washington, and uh -huh. I'm a big fan of uh, Black theater. And um, I had the 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 opportunity to be a part of Wine in the Wilderness um, presentation at Cal State Dominguez many years ago. Mm -hmm. And so when I saw that. Uh, Fences was coming to film. Of course, I saw it. Viola Davis earned that Academy Award. <laughs> yes, she I did. read on Facebook somebody said, "With well, that snot bubble, she I knew she <laughs> was on the Academy Award was worth that snot bubble." And I was like, that was that was a powerful scene. That whole movie was just like. I mean, Viola Davis and Denzel Washington. I don't know if they'll ever do another film together again, but yes. That well, I think they used to work together a lot. Mm -hmm. I think they used to work together a lot in theater in New York. So they had a working relationship. 
which is awesome. Because I think they did Fences as the play together. Yeah, yeah. I, I think one of the reasons why that film was so powerful is because they had done the play so many times in the past. Yep. They knew that script inside and out. They knew yep. the story inside and out. And um, that was a, just a great, a great film. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I totally agree. Yeah, it's just, yeah it's, it's like stories like that, you know, just when you see yourself on the screen, it's just, it's like, wow. Mm -hmm. Dealing with your issues that you can relate to. Exactly. Exactly. Which is why I I felt like having women of color filmmakers was so important because, you know, yes, we're starting to see more African-American films, but what about the Indian women, you know, or Latino films or Asian films? Like it's still very, very, you know, narrow window. And even when you see the top directors, you know, they had this list that came out that was all the top black directors. The only female was Ava DuVernay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's something wrong with that. (laughs) You know? You know what? There's a, um, I forget the name of the woman who directed Mudbound. Mm, Yes. Uh I did Daughters of the Dust and was it Daughters of the Dust and Mudbound? I think think it was Daughters of the Dust. Yeah, so the, both of those films, like Mudbound, like that film, it was so crazy. Like I was watching the intro and I was just like, hmm, it made, it made, that film made you think. And I tell you, Mary J. Blige, she acted her butt off. She was excellent. She was phenomenal. She was excellent. Phenomenal. It's like the older I get, the more and more I appreciate Mary J. Blige. She is just incredible. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She wears her heart on her sleeve. You know what I mean? Oh, we love Mary. Mm-hmm. That's why we love her. She oh, the, I was just looking at the director also did Bessie with Queen Latifah. That was oh, I saw that too. I saw that. That was great. That was a great film. And Pariah. That was her other one. I did not see Pariah, but I did I, haven't seen that I heard of Pariah. Actually, did I see Pariah? I know what it's about. Mm-hmm. about a, a a young lady who's either in her late teens or early twenties in New York, I believe. Right. Like, yeah, but. Um, yeah, Bessie and Bessie was good and Mudbound was just like, wow. Mm-hmm. That was a great film. I, I I felt like people didn't pay enough attention to that film. I agree. I agree. Okay. Sometimes those movies are hard to watch, though. Like, that was, Mudbound was something I could only watch once. It makes well, me upset. You know what? I, I have a question for you. Mm-hmm. As people are quarantined, what films do you recommend for them to watch, to expand their uh, their film palette, if you will. <laughs> recommend. Well, my film palette is pretty broad. What I just watched the other day was um, Motherless Brooklyn. That, um, that's Ed Norton's movie that he uh, wrote and directed. It's also a book adaptation. It's about oh, a detective okay. that has Tourette. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it's it's Motherless Brooklyn. Brooklyn. A motherless Brooklyn. It was actually really good. And, and so for me, because I'm a, a movie geek, I like to watch the movies and then look for commentaries with the directors and writers to kind of see how they put that process together. Right. And I really recommend that because it's really fascinating. Like it's really fascinating to see how these movies are developed, how they come along and how long it takes. You know, he was right. working on it for a long time. Absolutely. Um, the other one that I absolutely love, mainly because it was a diverse female cast, was Hustlers. Um, that was uh, based on the New York Times articles about the real women who were right, right, right. before the 2008 crash. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And reading how that came together and then how the movie was made. Right. And then why? And then of course J Lo was just like phenomenal in that movie. Right. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's a good one. Um, I don't know if you like horror. It wasn't really scary to me though. So yeah, I like all kinds of movies. Doctor Sleep was good. I like that movie. Um, you know, it really just depends on what you're into. Uh, you know, what series is good on Amazon Prime is um, Hunters. Have you seen that? I watched. I watched Hunters, and let me tell you. I couldn't stop watching. I uh, couldn't watch that in like less than a week. The whole uh-huh, me too. I really liked it because it really 
it really drove home the the idea of things are not as they appear, and that seems like that's a, a prevailing theme of the life we're currently all collecting. <laughs> Is that things are not as they appear. Exactly. <laughs> right. So I, I thought Hunters was really, really good. Um, you know, when you talked about films that take a long time to uh, bring to fruition, one film that took many, many years to bring to fruition that I'm a big fan of is uh, City of a Thousand Planets. Oh, I is it A Thousand Planets or Ten Thousand Planets? It's called Valerian. Valerian. Oh. City of a Thousand Planets. I haven't seen that one. That one is done by the same director and, and, and filmmaker that did Fifth Element. Oh, I love him. Yes. I forget his name. He's French. I believe he's French. But um, Rihanna is in um, Valerian. And I'm trying to think who else. Um, what's her name? The, act, the model. She's a model, actress. I think she's friends with Tyler Taylor Swift. I forget her name, but she's yeah. in the movie too. Yeah, Clive Owen, Ethan Hawke. Yeah. Oh, and Herbie Hancock is in the yeah. movie. I just I thought that. Herbie. Herbie Hancock is in the movie. I remember when I saw Herbie in the movie, I was like, oh, Herbie Hancock. Oh. oh, wow. I'm going to have to watch this one. Yeah, I hadn't seen this one. Yeah, that one. I was really, I remember when it was coming out, I was like really, really disappointed that people didn't give it more of a chance. It really didn't do really that good in the theaters, but I think as people are quarantined, that's a movie that they should definitely take a look at, so. Right, and you know, it's interesting you say that because that's something that people don't realize too, like what it takes to get a movie made. There's so many factors and elements. Right. And then things happen and you, you wonder, why did this movie sit on the shelf? Well, it could have nothing to do with the directing or the actors. Or it has all to do with the fights between the production companies. And, you mm -hmm. know, there's so much involved because there's so many hands in the pot. Oh. It happen a lot where movies get shelved because of that. You right, know? right. Yeah, you have the, the production. Because, you know, making a, a, a movie is like making a, a business from scratch. It really is. It's like uh, it's like making a business from scratch, and you don't have the luxury of failing once and trying. You, I mean, you literally got to get it right the first time out the gate. Right, and everything right from not just the making of it, but how you market it too. Right, absolutely. I mean, one movie that I, I mean, it is a little gritty, but I really liked it. Was called Destroyer, starring Nicole Kidman. And I've heard of that one, but I. Haven't they put like prosthetics so she looks horrible in that movie intentionally like they put uh -huh. stuff to make her look bad and she's just a down and out uh detective uh -huh. but i felt like they marketed the movie wrong because everything was nicole kidman how you've never seen her nicole before nicole kidman nicole kidman no okay, what's the movie about though you know right. Like, right. i get it you're right we've never seen her look like this she's always glamorous and beautiful but what's the story Right. Yeah. And they just didn't market it properly. And I think the film, and this is just my humble opinion. I feel yeah, like but you're right. You know, Game of Thrones just concluded last year. And one of the things that one of the characters said in the final episode was, you know, there, you know, a story is so powerful and everybody relates to it. And, you know, that was a line in, in, the, in the movie, but it resonated because it's so true. It was like people love a great story. That's right. It's love a great story, especially something with some unexpected twists and turns. People love a great story. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know, I just wanted to, to know, you know, how can, you know, business owners harness the, this is my final question. How can business owners harness the power of their story effectively in video? Oh, that's awesome. Awesome question. I would say, number one, be authentic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, definitely write it out, but think about the pain points that a lot of people are dealing with right now mm -hmm. and how your business can help solve that Right. while incorporating what it is that you're dealing with in your personal life. Like, for example, for me, uh, you know, within three days of, of us being uh, going into lockdown, I lost all my bookings because I do a lot of event photography and videography. And so it was definitely having to figure out how to pivot. 
I am a service-based business. Usually I'm with you. I, I like you and I shoot you. And you right, know, right, how right. can I transition that into um, help still doing what I do and helping other people and sharing that part of my story that I had to figure out how to pivot to so I understand what you're going through. Here are some tips and ideas that can help you be able to better um, do your business online. So definitely considering what other people are going through and sharing how your story can right. help solve that problem through right. your business. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's the main thing. That's powerful. And especially, you know, we are, especially because of social media, I think, I think we've always been this way, but social media has brought this out of us. We're all voyeurs. We like to see what other people are doing, you mm -hmm. know, and, and, you know, even though after a while I get sick of seeing food um, videos and things like that and photos, but we like to, we like to know what other people are doing. Sometimes we're right. inspired by it. Sometimes we're like, oh my God, I wish you would stop posting selfies, <laughs> but you're still looking at them. I don't care. Right, if you're right, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> so you know sharing those things makes you more human I means when this is all done people will appreciate you and your business mm -hmm. so much more because mm -hmm. they saw the compassion in you right right to start. Yeah. yeah that's awesome well landy i want to thank you so much for coming on to the jazz and tech lounge with lady z and I thank you so much for just sharing your insight about documentary making, filmmaking, and just uh, telling your story as a, a company. And please, one more time, please share how people can connect with you online. Sure. So thank, first of all, thank you so much for having me. This was awesome. It was a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. Um, and if you guys are needing my services or you need help or you need some consulting as you're dealing with pivoting and going virtually, or if you just want to see some of my work, you can always find me at bluechildentertainment.com. And if you're interested in learning more about prostate cancer and how you can take better care of yourself if you're a man or if you're a woman or a caretaker who has a husband who's honorary and don't want to listen, <laughs> you can always go to the silentkillerdoc.com. You can watch our trailers and we also have connections to helpful educational information on prostate cancer through various nonprofits that we work with. Okay, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you no so problem. much for for being here and until next time yes thank you so much bye-bye <laughs>